how to go from literally being afraid to even speak in front of people or pray in front of people to building a front facing eight figure per year income company. In today's episode, we're going to talk about how to go from a little small town to pursuing your dreams, being able to get the relationship that you want, build the lifestyle that you want, have the family and the kids and be the father that you want to be all while living in your dream location, following God's purpose for your life and building an eight figure a year income stream. Uh, my The friend that I have coming in today, I'm so excited to introduce to you, but welcome to God's Business, where I interview the top Christian business owners, thought leaders, and entrepreneurs and influencers, but they can teach you how to not have just a good business, but God's business, where he is the multiplier of your success. As I talked about, I talked to a great friend of mine who's a race car driver, one of the most interesting people that I've ever met. He lives in a beautiful location in Southern California, overlooking the water where the lots are literally $10 million per lot that his kid literally races RC cars in, which we'll talk about how he's done that with the channel. He's become a phenomenal husband, father, yet went from working construction to building this eight-figure per year revenue stream, and they've been able to influence others to do the same. Please welcome my friend, Phil Robbins. What's up, man? I'm so, I'm so pumped to be here with you. Yeah. And what's funny is that you were just telling me, I, I know your life, like I've seen your garage with your kids in it. And I think that that's epic. I got to figure out where that's at, by the way, is it, it's not in your house, but we'll talk about it in a second. You got your cars, your race cars, you guys have built this massive network marketing empire. And outside of that, this massive influence that, that affects not just that industry, but, but people all over the place. You got this beautiful place and, and I'm sitting here and I'm like, bro, get on this, get on my show. And you're like, bro, I like, like literally I've been on radio shows, but I just got on my friend's podcast. I don't do these things like this is, I think this is cool, right? Not everyone's on this podcast circuit. Not a lot of people have heard your guys' story. Yeah. Yeah. It's been crazy, but just, uh, I'm super excited to be here and just add value to everyone that you're pouring into. It was so cool. Like how we got connected and just your passion for motocross and what you've done over there. And then trucks, we both love all that too. So a lot of the things that I've done in racing and off-road, on-road, motocross, you're obviously a way better rider than me. I don't I don't do a lot of the jumps, but I'm really good in the cars. Has bridged so many worlds together and really given me that endurance mindset. So I was I'm I, we got to go run those four wheelers with no suspension. No one got hurt, but it was sketchy, but we had a blast, did we not? So I'm, it was it was so fun. Absolutely, man. And th- and that'll be just the very beginning of that. For for you, I'm interested to hear I'm always interested in people's two stories, right? Like I think that the man outside of the business is really big because that's that's the only thing that can actually grow the business is if we grow. And and our families, right? Like if we don't grow, like how does the man act with his family? So I want to get in all those things. I want to hear two stories first, which is like the faith, faith, relationship, and life, different aspects. How did you grow up? Did you guys grow up in the church? Did you not grow up in the church? Like what was that aspect? And I want to get to the point where you met your your wife, Sarah, and, and kids and all these things. Like, I want to get to that point. But what was your life like growing up? Where did you where did you live, et cetera? Well, it's interesting. So I grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan. You know, Wolverines, we do not like Ohio State fans. And it was a very right. interesting neighborhood that we grew up in. And then we, we ended up moving from uh, Ann Arbor to Ypsilanti, which is just on the outskirts, probably like I don't know, 40 minutes west of Detroit. So it was very interesting going from Ann Arbor. We're almost now living in this community where you can walk to school, ride a bike to school. Um, We hit a pool at our school to then going to Ypsilanti in one of these new track subdivisions. But we did back up to a little piece of property. So that was interesting. God knew that, you know, as a boy, we needed that little bit of property to run around. And we ended up meeting some neighbors and, and, uh, you know, I did grow up kind of in a Christian home. Um, we, our church actually met at a school. So we were always, you know, serving and setting up and taking down and kind of going through all the motions doing that. But God really got a hold of my heart at a young age. So through a lot of those moves where, you know, we could even go back and talk about, you know, we don't like to move a lot as kids. So just having the hope of whatever that is. For me, it was my first bike, being at the park. So these different places where you kind of get plucked out and, and, and placed in these new locations, but God had a plan for my life 
and and really had a setup with a really some close neighbors that were part of this movement that God was doing actually in our community. So, you know, we, we were around tractors and cutting wood and doing a lot of crazy stuff really at a young age. And, um, my faith, my faith walk was, you know, like God did move. It was, it was different than it was now, but really got a hold of my heart, probably around the age of 11 and 12 and then summer camp. So I'm a byproduct of God meeting me at summer camp. That's so wild. Cause especially to think like, you know, I think as parents, especially now my son's three. So I'm always thinking about you have one generation that doesn't push their kids, lets them do whatever they want. Another one that pushes them into every sport. And then we only years later get to hear the pros and cons of that. And, and to yeah. hear camp impacted. And you talked to even about like where you live, like moving locations, et cetera. It's interesting how like you look back and you see how God uses it all. My wife and I just went on Valentine's Day. I know you guys did as well, date night. Yeah. And and we went out and we at the last minute we went to Austin proper hotel. And it was like kind of annoying because, you know, it doesn't matter just the principle, no parking. So I show up and we're just gonna walk in and see what's going on. And they, they're like, Hey, Valley's forty two bucks to walk in. And I was like Of course. And I know you're in Orange County, so this is like everywhere. But I was like Bro, I'm just like, it's the end of the night. I want to go to bed. Like, I'm just literally going to walk in and this will be the dumbest thing I ever do. We end up meeting these people that that were like, it, I'm so glad we came here because it was only here because we met you guys. We we're able to like pour into these people at the end of our date night after having dessert. And it's amazing. What's craziest is that they go, man, we forgot to put you in our system. Uh, here is your keys. Just, I see your cars right there. You can just go ahead and drive. And I was sitting there like, this is hilarious. God, like, I literally was complaining about this and then I didn't even pay my $42 parking. And, and you talked about that as well with like moving like different places. You now live in Orange County. You're not in Michigan, but like if yeah. you didn't move out, you wouldn't have had these opportunities that you have now. I feel like God always says like, go out into all the nations, not like sit in your home to all the nations, you know, and now we have social, but still it's like a little bit different. So you, you, you're in Michigan you go through that upbringing, you have this encounter at 11, 12, kind of a byproduct. What was the time? How did you meet Sarah? What was the encounter? Well, what was I mean, we're going to jump a lot in there. So that's, that's, um, it's very interesting. So you progress from this new neighborhood and the things that I was exposed to. And there was actually a, an incredible move of God in, in that was happening through the, it's called, it was actually called like the word of God movement, which was kind of tied to the, the vineyard movement. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Toronto revival or the Toronto of airport course, church. Okay. So I, I have, I have I, two guys in the, in our men's mastermind that are literally from that church. That, I mean, so I was actually impacted there before summer camp. That's where God really started to be speaking to me. But then it would always go there back into an environment where um, I he had placed key mentors in my life that I didn't know that my dad would probably be praying for because I was just on another call. And I said, look, it says in the Bible, if we raise our kids up in the way they go, they'll never depart. But God yeah. is going to use everyone and even you, as you're as you're raising your kid now to 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 be able to ride his his bike and his dirt bike and progress, when when a coach comes along to really develop all the seeds that you planted, he will be able to have more of a return in his life than than maybe even your words. So now, as that's transitioning, these different moments of guys that were speaking into my life, or even other parents, that now I had a breakaway time to. You know, we, we did a lot with small engines. I had a, uh, you know, when I was 12 to probably 17, I just kept buying lawnmowers and would subcontract in my neighborhood. So we we ran all these different neighborhoods. I mean, I was probably doing five to 600 bucks a week cash just in 10 to $20 lawn jobs. So that progressed all the way up into these moments where I had encounters at summer camp, but then you'd always come back in your environment. And, and it was a big wrestling match, you know, as far as, Oh my gosh, you know, how, how can I ever at, you know, like live up to these words or this and that in my life, which led me to the point where I was actually just doing a side job for one of the neighbors. And, you know, it's interesting how God has people speaking into our life where you're there. And these were local, local friends. This was actually like a house eight doors down from me. And I was just doing a favor for them taking down the shed 
and I'm cutting the shed with probably a circular saw, like one of those, uh, some blades, taking the shed down to try to make an extra couple hundred bucks. And I cut my finger off almost to the bone. So it wasn't dangling, but it was cut to the bone. So it was yeah. a big defining moment in my life. It was, it was a summertime. And you know, as a kid, anytime that you're hurt in the summer, this is a big deal. So going from that point to then now having this time where my hand's going to heal, I'm fast forwarding probably a decent amount of time here. We're talking maybe at least 10 to 15 years because I'm, I'm at least 18, 19. I, I probably had graduated high school at this time because I met Sarah. Now it's one of my other buddies. And again, going back, I never really fit into a youth group. I was not in a church that had a very... Not it wasn't like a healthy youth group. We just didn't have it in in kind of the way that we're, we were doing church. Okay, so that was that was another tough for you know tough area. But I did have hockey, so I grew up playing hockey. So we had these different pods of of people that were around. But then you kind of you're ping ponging, right? You're not really like choosing a class that you're in. And what I mean by that is like a racing. I'm I'm, I'm racing two fifties. I'm racing four fifties, or I'm I'm you know running after football. So, you know, the ping ponging, having the ability to be open when my buddies actually would invite me, hey, come to our youth group or God's doing this night over here. It's like, I don't know. But for some reason this night, I didn't have any, I, I, you know, I got my finger wrapped up and two weeks before I had been invited to go to this like big youth rally in our, in, in another city and God was moving like crazy. And I was really more of, I always felt embarrassment by, by the feeling of someone looking at me, if it was my mom or other people in the church to raise my hands in worship. So I'm like, I'm not going to fully enter in, you know, I'm just going to kind of, you know, be back in here. But I had seen God move in all these other environments, which now I'm in this environment two weeks before I cut my finger. And yet God's moving. So I had this openness where I felt like God was drawing me back in in the season. And then now he was going to make a way through this injury in the summer when I would be doing these other things. And yet he was moving like crazy. Sarah's sisters were at, at this church, which was, you know, a, a Celine, um, a church in Celine, Michigan, which is probably like, I don't know, 35 minutes from the house. So we're at this service. Everyone after youth night there would always go and hang out at her house because they had swimming pool there on a couple acres and they they had like the house that you were going to be at after after whatever you know the hangout so that's how i ended up kind of being in that environment sarah came home she was at north central bible university up in um in uh in minnesota she was doing like these big worship nights with kirk franklin all these crazy things no one know about sarah okay she happened to be down because it was summer and then the night that I'm back at another worship night two weeks later or a month later with my finger. I, I got invited to go with one of my buddies. Sarah was a server at a little Coney Island. So like we roll in, probably had a NASCAR shirt on, which she would make fun of me and say if she was sitting here next to me. Yeah, Phil wore these, these hilarious cargo pants with cargo pockets and a NASCAR t-shirt, Dale Earnhardt shirt. And all he wore was this. No, I just wore it all the time. I only had one or two shirts. So I'm like... You know, sitting down and and just like, you know, being a guy, you know, we're sitting there probably ordering something. And my buddy at the time was talking to Sarah. She was a server and we were just like in and out. And I'm like, as what do, what do guys do? We're like showing our wounds. And she was like, yeah, I met this, you know, Phil sitting here showing me this wound. We are, we are me and Sarah, are the farthest apart of any sort of like match. And that's, that's really how, how I ended up meeting her. And then from there, if you have any questions now, I can go into like our first date and some other things that were pretty crazy, but that, that's like a 20 year lifespan right there. <laughs> I, for one thing I want to go, I want to go down the date route. Cause I want to see like, it's been really cool seeing you with your kids and, and how you pour into them. You had talked about some of the encounters that you had. How was it? How old were you when you went to the airport church in Canada? I, if I'm thinking back right now, it had to be between the ages of 12 and 20. Cause you go from 12, like at, the crazy thing is, so I saw, God, I, I've seen hundreds of people standing. This is like a Costco building right now. Costco, Sam's club, Home Depot, Lowe's empty. 
in the back, there was this massive balcony that was probably the size of almost like a football field where they had vending machines and just carpet and people would lay, there's tape. And I've seen people stand back there because this is like the overflow area and literally just get swept over and fall. And I'm like, this is, this is kind of weird, but no one touched them. But God would speak to me and he's like, wow, like church is a safe place to yield for yield in the Lord. And there's people that were just being wheeled in in wheelchairs and other things. At that time, like when I was out there with my dad in one moment, we would actually sleep in the minivan and he would bring us out and just be very intentional at creating these heartstrings with me and my brothers. But this was like an individual like dad getaway. So these were like moments that were cemented in where I'm there. I'm seeing stories that he told me that were playing out. I'm seeing the power of God move. And from that point to to then even now, I've seen other things where it's like, you know, and again, these are, these are my opinions. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but people trying to push someone over or on the opposite side. And again, learning how to yield to the spirit or being uncomfortable of raising your hands or all these other environments where I feel like I can't measure up in these moments. But going back to saying, wow, God, God, what do you want to do in this moment? So why, why now, five to five to 10 years you know, forward from these moments, have I been in a church environment where I'm like, when are you going to move? Oh, Phil, I can't move in this environment. I, I'm, not wanted, I'm not wanted here. What does that mean? The Holy Spirit is not allowed to move in this environment. So God will only come where he's invited. So if we're going to go and now apply that even you know, on, on the track or in any other situation or scenario today, I just was on another call. It's like, even my gen, gen three Raptor, we had another, um, uh, TRX on, on, on the trip and everything else. Yeah, and that how, truck how did it a do? Lot of fuel. It how did, did it well, okay. but it's, you know, going down the track and everything or going down these, it, it's a little more top heavy. And the way that the, you know, the, um, of course we got the guy in the blower. Um, the way that the suspension is going to cycle due to the weight of the truck, because my other buddy did come out of the rafter, but all in all, it did really good. And that truck shines in open areas. So, you know, on the dry lake bed, he's like 218. Your, 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 um, your truck will go 218 miles an hour on the rev limiter. Mine will do like, I think 109, 110. So on this like dry yeah, lake they, bed. They have like a governor just, on the on the Raptor, you can get it off, but it stops at 108. It's just like a governor. They but have the reason why they have that governor on there is because the actual drive shaft of the truck is only rated for that amount of speed. So when you overspin a drive shaft, that's only created for that amount of speed. Now you can, you can bring in drive line vibrations that can hurt the truck and the transmission at other levels. Uh, so it's created. See, like they, a, this is why we have smart people and, and tires. Like I've heard that the tires that are on the trucks uh, stock, aren't really supposed to go a lot faster than that either. Well, yeah, these tires, like the average, like the BF Goodwrench, all trains or the mud trains or the Toyos back in the day were rated for about a hundred miles an hour. I think now there might be 125 on the, on the street, but I mean, trucks are Toyos, bro. I'm pretty sure that's what I had on my Raptor. Those like Toyo all or mud ones that are like real aggressive. They look so sick, bro. I got to go look it up again, but there's, that's the one thing is like Raptors look good modified and there's nothing like the external look of the raptor the trx like it looks worse the more that you modify it really unless you like really do a lot to it where whereas like you you know you never i didn't even think about not raptors have also gotten better over the last since 2018 2019 they came out with the new bead locks that they came like they didn't have bead locks before and all that um so you had to do a lot before but that that truck definitely looks good, but I was just sitting right next to one at the stoplight. And I was just like, man, I can't believe that this guy's driving a truck that you can't hear. I was like, you can't even hear it. Are you saying I mean, you can't you hear the Gen 3? No, bro. It's so quiet. It's quiet, but it's got a lot of it's got a lot of power. I mean, that truck <laughs> off-road, that's all the power that you need. I'm gonna get you to <laughs> Baja exactly- on one of our trips. And, and, and again, that truck is designed to do a certain task in a, in a, let's say we have a segment of the Bajo 1000 that we're going to go to run. We're going to be on the actual race course. Like yep. we're talking a Raptor, not in the whoop section, but in a decent little section where we can run. Cause it, a Raptor in the whoops, like in San Felipe, we're talking <laughs> 10 miles an hour. Okay. So what oh, yeah. is the trophy truck doing the San Felipe whoops compared to a, to a Raptor or a TRX? 
10 miles an hour to 110 miles an hour. And these are six foot holes. There's a lot of lobbying on how they're maintaining these trails to, you know, kind of like edge the um, the top of these whoops off. Because these are natural. They're not like maintained or grown. These trails are changing all the time from, you know, water to every truck that goes through there. So um, now the competitive advantage in, in trophy truck racing is the full all-wheel drive trucks. But but the, still the two-wheel drive trucks have a competitive advantage because they don't have all the four-wheel drive you know, shafts with the cycling memory. We're cycling these suspensions at a very high rate as well. So every truck is going to shine in a different area and has to be able to put together, you know, the, even the Baja 1000, it's over 1,100 miles. It, it might be 1,059, it might be 1,110, depending on how many, we call them slabbing. So when you're on the pavement, you have a geo tag that will only allow the truck to go a certain amount of speed. So it's like the, a pit a pit rev limiter that's the same in the pits. If you go over that yep. speed and your cloud data on, on your truck isn't the same as the cloud that's, you know, it would score their overlaying on your truck, you'll get a penalty. You don't yep. want penalties and anything. So um, it's interesting. So you can't, you know, there's really no competitive advantage on, on pavement. The competitive advantage is not making a mistake and having your, everything dialed in correctly to the cloud. So it's like a military operation. Yeah, that I I just ha- I you know I I have to be like the TRX side because if I if I'm on the if I'm on the Raptor side then I don't have one anymore so it's kind of like you know I I think that uh, my uncle has a Raptor and I think you're right if I was to go off road you're you're right I just you know I drive to the gym and so yeah, I mean that- your truck right now there's already a guy in Texas I think they have that truck in the nines. No, high nines and they do a 10 or 10 no i'm saying they, or i mean sorry 1000 you no you're saying, saying thousand hor- horsepower i'm saying nine second quarter miles oh nine second Hoosiers. quarter mile that's crazy. so high nines tens i mean for a truck i mean he's beating lambos and everything not like a 1500 horsepower lambo but the trx is an incredible truck so i love them i love all I, but it's like, what was it engineered to actually do? So that's what your question was going back into it. So sometimes it's yeah. not, it's about the horsepower. So you could run a Ford Ranger with a V6. It can't break itself in, in a lot of the other segments where a trophy truck can break itself. So you have to pull back so that me and you, when we tag out, there's still some of the truck left. Every decision that you're making is our ability to go farther. So you're making good decisions with that truck because it has to last. So, and, and you know, for the really people listening, to- like you could tell this guy knows what he's talking about when it comes to cars racing. Did you, at this point before you met Sarah, were you already racing stuff or was this something that happened no. later? No, not really racing, but always like had a truck and a dirt bike and a dog. I mean, that was my, that's what I wanted to do. I was a carpenter. I was framing. So went to school to do that. God really kind of put me in this program, even in my school. And we had a coach slash teacher that he he trained us like like a ceo of pulte would his executives and and god had me in this program because in between going to school like we i was only in school maybe two to three hours a day and then we were on a job site where he taught accountability and we were crew leaders and every year we either we dug the basement and built the house framed the house roofed the house and then the following year we would finish the house so I did that for four years. So God had me positioned always in these right areas where I fit in because I never fit in the exact in the exact mold, which, you know, I, I, I ended up going to probably 10 different schools. You know, the, I was moved around a lot. They were trying to figure out what was wrong with me a lot of the times. So it was diagnosed as, you know, AD, ADD, ADHD. So, so wait, they moved around because of they were trying to get you in different schools and different environments, or was it something else as well? They just were like, we, we, we're going to put you. Yeah. In my parents schools. were always trying to do the best for me, which in turn, you know, had me in different schools and different environments, not necessarily public school, but um, yeah. So I saw a lot there as well. That's so interesting. I feel like, you know, what would they have, what was so wrong? You just weren't paying attention or you're getting in trouble. What? Yeah, I think there, there's, there's a, um, 
there's a big correlation of a, of a situation that just happened with one of my buddy's sons. I won't go into detail, but the same thing happened with me. And the enemy, because there is there there are a lot of us men that if we go back from the age of twelve to the to maybe our college graduation, where there were people in authority in our life that spoke words into our life that if we actually look back over those words that were spoken, something died in us. Like wow. you're never going to amount to anything. Who do you think? Like you're never going to graduate if you keep doing this. Instead of being the coach and saying, hey, I know you're struggling here, but I'm calling you to a higher standard. So it, ca- it caused wounds in my life or areas where I just didn't care. Crazy. So that probably could. No, go ahead. Say that. Um, yeah. So I remember being, you know, in certain times where they were trying to figure out what was wrong with me because I did struggle in some learning. I learned very hands on. But remember, going back to the neighborhood where, where the Lord moved us as at me as a child, and you know, I had the neighbor that was doing a little bit of farming in the backyard. They were they were kind of doing some other stuff with the church, and she, they had seven kids. I mean, this guy I, I'll never forget. I mean, they were hunting uh, woodchucks and deer and everything else to feed their family, bro. Like it was wild. But God had me with him, and he would be the one to fix my lawnmowers and help me. And I would barter and split wood for him. And, you know, I remember even, even during quote Y2K, I, I made a deal with him. I said, okay, I will split wood for you for $10 an hour, but I need unlimited hours. So after school, I will come in and split. This is a job. I split so much wood. This dude owed me thousands of dollars. He couldn't pay. <laughs> so yeah, I remember work helping him. Sure. Yes. But then he would speak into my life and he would have other other um, men that would come out that would work on the weekends and he had people that were bringing him wood and he would, you know, take an engine out of another car and put it in this car. And I was just there. Sometimes eight hours, six hours. Where are you at night? I'm over here with Paul Sholin. Yeah, I wrote it in my book. Actually, his wife was my editor for my book because I handed my book off. It was a hot mess. I just tried to write it down. I'm like, this is the craziest, hardest thing I've ever done when I wrote it. But yet, it you know, it's, it talks up. The name of my book is called The Secret Garage. The Lord has always had me in this, in the garage over here. But then when he speaks to me, he says, Phil, go write it down. So now for tying back into all these other moments to go back and ask, you know, answer your question about the Toronto Airport Church and the vineyard and how God was moving in all these other environments. And in, in even me back in 12 or 2012, or, or sorry, when I was 12, these seeds were deposited in me of curiosity in the spirit. And again, today, even on our other call too, our Wellspring call, and then my yeah. other men's call today, like to see sometimes those seeds that were sitting dormant come to life in our faith. Because when we're reading the word, we can have too much word inside of us. And again, not saying that we can't have too much. But you could study right now to go and race Baja and everything else for the next 5, 10, 20, 50 years. But if you never apply it and strap in a truck, what good is it? Yep. So what good is it if we read the word all the time and we know that God's called us to get on a podcast or do a prayer call, but we're scared to get on Zoom because the link's not going to work and I'm going to have, I'm going to be frustrated. I'm not going to know. It's not easy, right? Like I'm laughing because I mean, Sarah will laugh. Like you're 90. Well, we could hire someone to figure it out. Like it is, it is not easy to sometimes do the things that, that God has necessarily called us to do. But, but everything today are things that I said I would never do. Like I was terrified of speaking or doing, but now it comes out of my heart. What is inside of me? And that's, that's really what you see in, you know, in, in racing or behind the scenes with what you're doing with all these men and everything else. You have a crazy story of overcoming in so many circumstances and situations through, you know, your, your family business and the things that you saw, the decision that you made to do it. Maybe I'm not going down that fork in the road. I'm going to do this. Maybe I can have faith over here. Maybe I can apply this. What does that look like to for me to separate myself and then go apply this, even if it's hard. But then with a coach, 
be put into a hard situation that you can overcome. So good. I was, I'm like, I was trying to just don't, don't take them off the roll. Don't take them off the roll. I, I need to know you left me on a cliffhanger with you meet, meet Sarah and how long until you guys got married? What? Because it's interesting to me. You're talking about, man, I had all these troubles and I, I had only a few shirts that I would wear. She's like, why do you wear that shirt all the time? You're like, what else am I supposed to wear? And you're saying this girl. It was my pool. construction clothes. You, she's got the pool. She's got the, you know, the house everyone wants to go to. What, what was the dynamic there? How did you guys get together? So um, with, with my other buddies, we started going to this youth group and kind of like overlaying it. I, and, and like the spirit of God was moving to where we would actually go to that. Um, to be quite honest with you and honest with everyone, I had the desire to host these Bible studies even in high school where my dad would kind of like lead us and we would come in and I was in building trades at the time. And my teacher at the time was like accountability, right? So he's like, you guys are not going to be coming to school high. You guys aren't going to be coming to school like this and that. You're coming. There's accountability here. You are going to take responsibility for your actions. You are not going to be like some builder or electrical contractor or HVSA contractor or whoever these guys are that are going to live a life of saying it's someone else's fault or it's someone else's issue. You're going to take responsibility. So if you're going to go out there and do that, don't do it here. So when we started doing and hosting these Bible studies, I mean, it was like we would leave and then we're kids. We're like, oh, yeah, we're going to go smoke and hang out and do these things because I grew up kind of like in, in, in a little bit of the inner city. We'd hang out. I was in a lot of places where I knew that I was out, not necessarily out of place, but pushing the boundaries. But yet God was saying, Phil, I have the plan for you. So we're desiring the things of God. And it was like this battle both ways, even in our mind. And I remember my dad would always just speak truth, speak life, and he'd be, he'd be praying people out of my life. So a lot of that is now like overlaid with my relationship with Sarah that I had this desire because before that, like I didn't have that many dating experiences as far as like girlfriends and sexual encounters and all these other things. God protected me from that area. I have a lot of friends that have had that. So I never really understood from ninth grade all the way to 12th how some of my buddies were interacting in all these environments and all these situations and, you know, especially the sexual stuff. I'm like, man, how come I can't have this too? Even though as a, as a believer, I knew, but I never had that edge. So now as I'm dating a lot of my girlfriends at the time, and I didn't have a lot with this other girlfriend or this other girl that I was dating, they didn't like the fact that I was so driven and working all the time. So it didn't necessarily work out, but yet always had a heart for serving at the church now through this season. So when I met Sarah, it was different. This other girl that I was talking to was like, hey, I remember we're walking out in the mall. Sarah, we got to do a podcast one day um, too, where we get the, where we get our wives together because it would be really funny right now to ping pong. Because I remember I'm at this like mall. It's freezing in Michigan. So the only place where we hang out is at the mall or at stores where the heat's on because it's like 10 degrees. Well, it can be raining. So we're in this environment. And this girl at the time was like, hey, you should talk to Sarah, Sarah Fairless. I'm like, oh, okay. But remember, I had talked to her when I, the day at the Coney Island, right? She will tell you she was disgusted with this guy, which is me. Like, what's more disgusting? But think about it. As men, what do we do? We're like, you know, I... Me and my, all my brothers, I mean, there wasn't a bird or an animal that lived in our backyard. We shot everything. My dad's like, you got to stop shooting the state bird. You know, we're dragging everything home, animals, this and that. So we're always as men trying to show off our, our war wounds and all these other areas. So now we're bridging the gap between, we're bridging the gap between this, like, you know, me as this dirt bike riding, business focused you know, you know, I love the Lord but to a princess and just by everything that now she would say that she was going through in her life, even as a, as a believer, but then in college and then God was moving in all these other areas. And then she meets me. I mean, I am like, I am like a, a wrecking ball when I get around people. Cause I'm bringing joy. I'm bringing passion. 
and through a lot of the areas in my life where my dad had just prayed a lot of that out. I remember even too, like if it's with substances or in, in these environments where I, everyone's like, why are you always so happy? I came to the place where I really wasn't even happy inside. I'm like, wow, I'm actually subduing one of the gifts that God put in my life so I can actually be me. So that was a big revelation too. So this is all happening and snowballing very fast, even when I met Sarah, because she had came, you know, so now we kind of like go on this like one date um, and, or we're hanging out and I'll never forget it. So this is like, is this going into too much detail? I'll tell you no, the first bro. conversation. Okay. No, no, no. I want, I want to hear this. I, when she, when she listens that she's going to laugh. So for some reason in the winter time, again, we didn't have a lot going on. So one of my other buddies, he owns a very successful heating and cooling company. And there was like revival was breaking out all over our counties. But Randy, I, I was always praying that God would give me someone like you, Nick, that I could follow that had a TRX, a successful company, a successful family of what I saw on the outside, but then had character and was walking in power. Like not just 700 horsepower power, like laying down some rubber, but then having that power and authority in leadership and everything else, but allowing people to come around and really pouring in. So that was Randy in my life. And Randy had all these grand visions. He was funding all these, this big nights of revival and here and there. And this is expensive. And I'm like, what the heck is he doing? This guy was selling sand from Lake Michigan, building beaches and all these crazy environments and and every time that NASCAR came to Michigan or all these big events, he would build these like massive beaches for beaches for Budweiser, Miller Lite, all these other things that were going on. So we're around these environments. And then he invited me. He, he ended up uh, making a deal with this guy that had this very rare forest in Michigan of all this oak hardwood. And his dream was to build a house and, and all these other homes on his property out of wood. So he's like, hey, Phil, we're going down to Indiana to buy this this." Uh, wood processor so we go down to indiana and we buy this wood processor it was probably like seventy five thousand back in the day now who knows it's probably 300 grand and and you basically can take a seven to ten foot log and and then you're going to mill it down so in between that trip was when i was actually i remember being in the back of my buddy's truck we're towing it back i was talking to sarah on the phone do you remember the puppy love days where now it's easier. We probably talk to our buddies more than we talk to our wife because I've been married 19 years. Yeah. But back in the day, you're like on the phone and you don't hang up and like all these things and you're dreaming and, hey, how's it going? And then we get back after that whole entire trip. And then I think I invited her out to dinner and in the ice sculptures in Michigan. You have any questions there before I go into the next little part? I, I, what's the heck? What's the ice school, bro? I'm, I'm from, so I'm from where you're at now is where I was born, and I stayed until two years ago. I didn't experience any. I yeah, had, you even, I don't prom, even have a winter jacket. I didn't even have a winter jacket. Like, I never, never had. <laughs> well, it. we, we, we had Arctic car hardware. It was freezing in Michigan, but it doesn't yeah. matter. I love cold environments. I love all that. So, no, no, keep you going on, on your track. I'm, I remember taking her out on a date to dinner and really um, just being me. Because remember, God told me it was okay to be myself. You know, like I had the Holy Spirit, but I was still, it was like trying to harness the fact the first time that you threw around a 450 on the track with all that power and could actually land. Like you didn't care. You're just laying it out. It was childlike faith, childlike joy. And it's contagious. So going to dinner, I dressed up. Probably was in my you know finest little leather jacket, no hat, hair all hair all done, and it was freezing. And we're walking around, and they bring they would bring in um, the most world renowned chefs and sous chefs and all these uh, artists from all around the world, even China, Japan, Belgium, Sweden to do these ice sculptures in this town called Plymouth, Michigan. And some of these ice sculptures would be like this, like over 150 feet long, like massive dragons or your business name and logo, like Kings, your, your ministry name or your, you know, your big event, um, 
your mastermind. So like King's mission or a whole entire truck or a car, and then it would be dyed and they would do these. And then there would be competitions. So we just happened to go there after a date night and we're walking around and probably an hour in, I'm freezing or 30 minutes in and I'm looking at Sarah and she has this like big puffy jacket and this white knit hat with a pom-pom. And I'm eyeing the hat. I mean, my ears were freezing. So I'm looking, laughing, acting silly. And I'm like, she's like, why do you keep looking at my hat? So I'm freezing. Can I, can I borrow your hat? You got hair. So she gives me her hat and I'm running through. Bro, this is like Buddy the Elf. I'm skipping around and act and just clowning around with this hat on. I just didn't care. And she comes back in. Um, you fast forward from that moment to then when we got engaged. We were engaged for a year. Uh, we dated for a year, engaged for a year, um, and then ended up getting married. And part of her vows were even that. So her sisters actually wrote a song. She thinks my tractor's sexy. Do you know that song? Yep. And it's and they wrote this poem around it. And it was basically country boy meets city girl. And then Sarah goes in and was like, yeah, like Phil really came alongside of me and brought out just you know, who I was in all these areas. And that was this, this kind of like meshing and everything else. And then also too, as I was praying at that time, um, Sarah would probably say that I brought a lot of craziness and joy and broke every single rule in her house, as far as between her mom and dad, the way that they grew up with three girls in the home. Cause what do you think the first thing that I did when I walked in their house was? Not take off your shoes. I, I don't know. I walked inside and opened the fridge. Oh. I I didn't know you're not allowed to do that. I'm sure that went over well. Yeah, that went over like a fart in church. You know, it's like <laughs> that's, that's exactly what my dad says actually. <laughs> and no. yeah, dude, that's like such a guy no. thing. That's such like a. I've never been around all these women that are like the you know like that's all sisters and all this. I've never been in there. I have friends that have done that, and and my wife will be like. Did that person just do that, bro? And it gets, you, you learned it, right? Like you got, you guys are obviously together. There's no way you like didn't learn that after a while. And you have a personality, but you've seen these guys. I just had a guy that he does real estate. He builds homes. This guy came into town who also does Airbnb. They had never met. And this guy goes, Hey, is there, is there any way I could stay at your place? And so this guy goes, Oh, sure. He comes in. I guess this guy was like, rubbish in all of his cabinets all throughout the night he was like trying to stay longer he like took advantage of this guy in every single way i was like and the guy didn't even know like didn't even notice he's just like well, just that's just who he is just like and he's a single dude that you know is still single because he didn't at least learn the lesson of the walk in the walk in the house start just taking the food um, but I was the same way, man. I remember going to my best friend's house and it finally, his parents had to have a sit down with me and be like, yo, st either you need to start paying us or you got to stop eating all of our food. And I was like, you guys offered it to me like one time. And so like every day I went there, I was like eating stuff out of their house. You just don't know it. That's hilarious, man. It's so you know, true. Yeah. That's, I think it's, I think your guys' story and, and all the stories and the things that you guys have been through. So how the heck did you make it out to the West Coast then? Like you guys, if, if people wow. haven't seen yet, if you go look at Phil's story sometimes, he has cute little kids. They have this beautiful house that's overlooking the Pacific Ocean. Uh, you're in Orange County, but is there a specific area like Laguna Beach or what's the exact area? We're in, we're in Dana Point. Dana Point. So they're overlooking the ocean. And so they got the sun sets and sunrise on the opposite side. So beautiful spot. And so it's not... Like you physically can't really shoot anything from your back patio anymore. You can't, you can't be shooting guns. Can't no. be using the BB gun, knocking out birds though. I've seen you guys well, take the empty lots with your kids and still do some of the stuff with the extra space. But how the heck did you guys make it out there? Yeah. So it was interesting, like through, you know, our, us building our business and everything else that, that was a, a massive progression. Cause me and Sarah were both youth leaders and, and then Sarah was a teacher I was in construction, so we bridged those worlds. And I mean, I could I could talk for hours on the breakthroughs that happened there to get us to this point. So when our when when the opportunity for us to even join our business 
happen the you know we we're in san we we're a san francisco based company came out to, we did some events in napa and in southern california which is tied to pelican hill have you ever golfed pelican hill i haven't i've only driven by it all right so we got it we got to come out here my buddy's a member up there i'm not a big golfer but i i love and can take in you know the the landscaping and being out there and everything else we'll do we'll do one car canyon day and then we'll do one golf day and you, you'll probably like the Canyon day better, but being on Pelican Hill and golfing it and just looking out there, it is one of the most stunning golf courses. It's actually so big. They don't do a PGA event there because every PGA course, you have to have the ability to walk. So yeah. it's like, so it's so big. And then Monarchs right around the corner here, but we started staying there and doing a couple events there. And then as we grew in our success and I transitioned and gave my construction company to my brother and started walking out some of these words that God gave me in the transition process, um, we would come out here and spend the, the winters out here and we stayed at Pelican Hill and they had some, you know, we could do a long-term rental on property. They have these like two bedroom condos that are stunning. So with the first time that we came out, I mean, I loaded up my race trailer. So I had at that time, my my uh, first track car was one of our comp our company cars that we could buy. So I'm like, all right, I want the biggest engine in two wheel drive that you make. And our partnership was with Lexus, which is not necessarily the best track focused car, but it ended up being a very reliable car. So my first track car was a Lexus ISF, which is a V8 car, two wheel drive, and that that motor is a 5.0 liter V8 built by Toyota Motorsports and Yamaha Racing. So very interesting. That car now has done a lot of some endurance stuff, and then it's gone back into like the LFA, which, you know, now Lexus says their Halo car, which they built an entire probably, I don't know, $800 million uh, carbon fiber um, facility. I had a chance to buy one. I should have because that car now is worth over a million bucks. But uh, some cool stuff with Lexus. Then we came out here, and that that was my introduction to racing. So being out here, staying for four months, and God started really doing a lot. So He kind of cemented us in here, and for a season, and we did come back and forth for a little while. And then one season where I was, you know, doing some track stuff, and I had my motorcycle out here and my car, and would do some track days, and got invited around. God really started kind of like writing on our hearts that he was bringing us back to Michigan. We still kept our house back there. And this is like when the gateway opened of, of mass explosion into what we would do in the marketplace and in business and in all these different countries. But uh, India being one of the number one countries other than what we've done in America, a lot of the things that we do in America in education and food and just tangible building projects. We don't really post a lot of that on social media. Um, we probably should now. I don't know why we necessarily did. Then we do a lot. We do a decent amount of stuff in Israel too with bomb shelters. And that came into big play even over the last three years. Um, that's a whole nother story there too as well. But then India, uh, a lot of my customers, probably like 30% of my customers in Michigan when I owned my construction company, now that we go, we went back to Michigan, were, were in from India. So God had given me not only a lot of interaction with Indians, which I absolutely love the Indian culture right now. And a lot of my Indian friends would say that they are incredible at negotiating on the back end of a deal, even if a contract is set in stone. So I love that ability. So I'm like, wow. So there, there was a lot of different um, things that were happening when, when God really called us over there. But so it, it was kind of a fast progression from, you know, our, our roots in California to then going back to Michigan and then almost like this global ministry and mission, missions happening at the same time, which would then in turn lead us back to California and kind of re-cement in with our friends group out here and and really, again, God really putting on my heart saying, hey, Phil, I have, do you trust me? Because I was set in Michigan. We didn't even have to sell our house as fast as we did, but he even wrote that on my heart as well. Do you trust me? I've lived a life, and Sarah, Sarah would come on and actually echo that. We've lived a life of at certain points in our life, almost giving things away. And, and what I mean by that is like, okay, so sometimes when we're going to outgrow that company or give that away, 
we've had these different things that we've had to do and steward in, in the way that God's called us to actually do that, which didn't necessarily look or go the way that I thought it was going to go. And what I mean by that is, even now as we're entering 2023, as you're pouring into so many people, they're like, how can I walk into success? What am I going to partner with? How am I going to add that to my business? How, with all these things coming at us, specifically, I believe that God has something specific for each and every one of us, that when we make a commitment to do it, that we can follow through with that commitment and have a, have a mindset of endurance and know that if God's called us to do it until the season is, and again, that's not like a, just a little over word because we throw around a lot of different words, but an actual season that he's like, okay, maybe that has dried up or maybe I'm moving you into something else. But with a stewardship model of, of a process, not just like here one day, gone the next day, but stewarding it with accountability in our lives. So that's how we, you know, like um, even from a racing standpoint, like if you're coaching me, Nick, in, in, in how to really understand the suspension and the rebound of, of a dirt bike in different, in different dirts, like we were watching the motor race the other day coming from the sand into the straightaway. You, you did notice a lot more sitting down and, and reloading and loading and where you are on the seat to where you are in proportion to the actual bikes to get the maximum traction in a certain segment. Yeah. So like a lot of that has how I really make my decisions in where I'm going to move my family because a lot of it is unknown outcome. But again, if, if I'm going back to the progression of my life, and say, wow, I've ran this track before. I know what it's like to be in the sand. I know how I got to enter the sand. And, and, and I really have to enter the sand, set back, loose, and allow the bike to actually bobble and weave, but know that when I'm going to get through, I'm going to able to be able to apply that, that, that throttle to that situation and to that motorcycle to get the maximum amount, but still be flexible. And that's really how we've overlaid this last season. So I, not knowing the end in sight, but knowing like how it's going to all fit in for us to be out here because it wasn't easy. We actually made the decision to really just be out here for a couple months. This was just kind of like a, a winter getaway. Wow. And, that, and then it transitioned into so much more. And, you know, then 2020 hit, Ju Ju we ended up having another baby. Judah is not technically a full COVID baby, but Sarah was pregnant during the beginning. And then we had him in August of 20. Yeah, 20. So kind of during everything, during the fear and everything going, going, going around. And, and I really had to lead my home through a lot of these issues and, you know, the traveling and, you know, a lot of situations on there. We could do a whole nother breakout, how we got out of that and how I was able to steward these moments and, and still growing myself. And, you know, we did a lot of the RC stuff. We did a lot of these other environmental things because I don't do good not going and, you know, then pouring into my wife that was pregnant with all these, you know, the sound bots that were coming out every single day. It was a lot. Yeah. So that's, it was a progression of being out here. Do I trust? And, and maybe the question is today, even for a lot of guys that are on here, do you, do we have trust? issues with God where we're at right now because I even had trust issues even if we're going back to the you know me and my Bible studies with my dad to where we're coming in and seeing God move I had seen him move in all these other areas but I had a trust issue in an area and it I did I wouldn't say that it was that at that time but I would say that it was like, wow, I felt God calling me to a higher standard of an area where I could actually trust him. So I could release so many things that were actually holding me back and giving me the ability to actually apply more. Like, like, like a different segment at a motocross track. Because every rider has their strengths and weaknesses in each segment. Yeah, and I like how you say it with seasons because the seasons are, it could be used as a blanket word, right? Just to... This is the season that I'm in, but really by the term is like, no, there it changes, you know, and it's like, it's not forever. And sometimes people feel like while they're in a busy season, they feel like it's forever. And they don't know that, like you said, yeah, you're, you're in the sand motocross, you're standing up, you're leaning back, you're keeping the front wheel light. 
as soon as you get back on the hard pack though, like you're not like, they're all sitting down, they're getting a little squirrely sideways out of there. Cause it's, it, and it's, it's done differently. It's, there's an end to it and there's an X phase, there's whoops, there's jumps, there's turns, there's, and, and I, I like the analogy with that. And I love, I love what you got, where you guys live now. I had no clue. We had met what, maybe like eight months ago. I don't even know the yeah. exact time, but it, but less than a year ago. We met ago. in Colorado in August. August. So, and I wouldn't have even remembered that. So that's like, you know, we're going, we're, we're going to hit the year mark here soon. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't even know why you guys got out there. I know that, how, how old's your oldest kid? Seven. He just turned seven. Seven. So you guys were married for 12 years before you guys had your first. That's wild. And then now, now to what's some of the biggest things that you've learned either from your past or current or biblically of the, of how you fathered. You know, one thing I've seen that uh, I love when people post on social, this inspires me too. Cause like when you're with your kids, I'm like, Oh cool. I can take from some of that and think of putting myself in that environment. It's like, if you saw a motocross racer training, you're like, Oh yeah. wow, I should hit the gym. You know, and, and people would say, oh, well, he's just saying he's showing that because he wants to look good or he or someone wants to look like a good dad. Or there's the people that say, I don't care if people see me. I don't want to be famous. I don't want people to know. And I'm like, dude, like it inspired me to be like, man, I want to go. If you saw me in Kingston, we got this little I have a horseshoe pit in the backyard, but it's all overgrown right now because it's kind of uh, it's cold and no one's throwing horseshoes and uh, colder. You know, for me, like 50 is like freezing and. And so we got this sand and bro, we've been doing slow-mo videos with my iPhone with monster trucks and it's like, and just like ripping fat roosts and like we're out there for like, I'm no joke. The last couple of days, probably two to three hours a day, like two to three hours, just like ripping in the sand. My knees are hurting because I'm squatting and it's just like sick, man. But, but I seen that with you. What's been the thing that's inspired you or led your key things that you've learned with being a dad? Well, I think the key, the biggest key, God has given me definitely a father's heart. Um, even this morning when, when um, I think Jamal was actually sharing, all of us, when we accept Christ, we have a lot of, we all have gifts that have not been activated in a certain time or a certain season that we have the ability to ask for. So that's one. So the same way that when you started riding, you know, dirt bikes, even from your 50 all the way to the to the main event, took you a lot of time and a lot of learning and a lot of applying. So when you yield to that, and now you're you're like, wow, I'm willing to put myself in that environment, because it's a choice to be out there for three hours on your knees videoing, but you're being intentional about that. A lot of guys right now, they're like, wow, how can I be intentional about taking my wife on a date or taking three hours during the day to do that with my kids when I can barely even pay my bills or I can't, it's all positioning, mm. but yet being okay in some of these other areas where it's like, even if it's something small and you're like, okay, for the next two months or three months, I'm going to take $5 a, a week. Or I'm not going to, you know, have a coffee today or, you know, and then, and, or we could go all the way up into the highly successful guys that are like, I'm going to take back one of this, one of these business trips, or I'm not going to run, run after that next race season. So I'm going to position myself because I deal with both. They're like, I have no time. I can't do this and that. And right now I've chosen because the Lord really put on my heart an invitation the desire of my heart to be around my kids. And not necessarily work 70, 80 hours a week, which sometimes yeah. can be hard in my mind because I feel like, well, I'm not adding up. I'm not crushing it like Nick's doing. You're on, you're here, you're there, you're doing this. But again, I don't know your day to day life either. But people do, they'll look at our life and what we're driving and all these other things and think they can never aspire to do all these different things in their life. But if they're able to yield and write the vision, I want to spend an hour a day with my kids, or I want to spend an intentional three hours this week with my kids to create heart strength so our hearts can communicate because everything that we get from now to the age of 15, 16 to 18, even 21, those are our communication roadways that we're building with our kids that have to be intentional. And it's the same way with our wives. 
because when we're in close quarters together, it I really felt like the Lord came to me and, and was really just putting on my heart. Phil, when you're intentional in these areas, you're growing. It's Psalm 127. We're, we're growing our kids and we're launching them. We're pulling back and we're launching them into the world. So taking that time, like when you show him the video of slow motion of that, he's looking at that, that he did that. His mind is blown. Fine, I'll go do it again. And you would say it goes in cycles. One day he might want to ride his bike. Another day he's going to do this. And all these little encounters are all different, but they all are adding up to something great. And that's the same with our relationship with our kids, our relationship with our spouse, our relationship with our employees, and our relationship with right now as we're talking to this camera. Because we're sharing with people on the other side that are going to come in and look and say, how can I do that? Even if it's just a little bit, or even if it's a little bit pulling back, how can I add this without losing? What's what's really interesting about that is that you talked about that there's some people out there, they're, they don't have the money to take their you know kids or their wife out to do something. And so because of that, that's their big like, oh, well, it would be easy, right? If you are running these businesses to, you could go to dinner, not think about it. But you have the, and then you have the business owner that comes out and they go outside in the backyard and they're, they're thinking about the liabilities, the people, the other projects that are going on. There's always like, there's always going to be something, right? Like me and my wife at one point for three, four years, we had like a $25 eating out budget split, but so $12 and 50 cents, which nowadays would be like, and this was like literally eight years ago, nine years ago. Yeah. But now even, even now Chipotle is like more than that. So but in general, let's call it 50 bucks. Let's double it and like $25 each. It's like we didn't really have a lot of wiggle room with like where you go. If we went to the same place for like four years because on happy hour, it was like 25 bucks if you just ordered water and just ate. And that's what we did. But like the, 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 the excuses never are there. Like it's not a money excuse. It's always that intention excuse. Like you talked about, you know, who does this really good that I've been trying to get a hold of. Just to ask him this question is Brian Deegan. If you look at Brian Deegan with his kids, I've been very inspired. And I've been, I was inspired by him by this. For people that don't know, Brian Deegan was a, a motocross racer turned freestyle guy on metal militia and, and basically helped form freestyle. He has kids and now his daughter is racing cars. I think she even raced NASCAR, some stuff. And so she's like a, a, a chick that's literally like, better than 99% of any guy racing, anyone in the world racing. And she's out there with the biggest sponsors, Ford. Then he has other kids as well. But one thing that he did so well, and I'd love your thoughts on this, is I just created this for my son. I haven't created his YouTube yet, but I created his TikTok, his Instagram. And I was like, you know what? What if I just capture these moments and set them up on a platform? Like I got, I have my full-time video editor that we're hiring right now. I was like, no, I can't just have an agency. I need a full-time person editing because I would love to just prop up and remember these moments and create a platform for my son the way that Deegan's did for their family. And now it's changed a whole sport. I mean, this kid, this guy's son has a million plus followers on YouTube. He's attracting thousands of people to every race. And he just turned pro two weeks ago. And you're just like, and he got the kid a, a seven figure contract. And again, these kids aren't spoiled. They put in the work. If you follow this guy, he's great. Yeah. Seven figure contract, even if it wasn't, but he, he has a career at 17 years old. This kid has put in the work, but he has a platform that gives him a real career and changed everything. It's like, man, how, how, how could I stop thinking so much online? So taking it one step from present, one present being there, intentional. And then the other one was, I have a vision with my life, but what if I could take his vision into consideration and go, God, like, how could I start setting him up? Not just in giving him baseball practice or getting him a tutor, learning an instrument, but like, what is a way today that I could start investing in his future that's even more than money? And one of it was like, man, you know what? I'm so selfish. I post on my social social media, like, I'm going to get him drumming, bro. You got to see this video. I got him drumming in the backyard, bro. Sand, drumsticks. It's flying. He's got goggles on so he doesn't get sand in his eyes. And it's like he's drumming. And and so I grab it and I'm like, you know what? I'm posting this for him. And I'm like, man, I feel this not wanting to do it because, you know, it's it's work. 
but also it's like, well, I could be posting on mine and that's important because it's for business and blah, 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 blah. I'm like, oh man. So how, how do you, what do you think of that with like investing in our kids for the future and like setting up their visions, not just ours, the Deegan family, all of that? I mean, I think that's so huge. It's, it's, it's kind of awesome you say that because I started a YouTube page, me and Sarah for G, and I haven't been the best at posting in there. It's called uh, RC Cars for Kids. And I'm probably going to get better at that. I mean, as far as editing videos, I mean, the time that we could be, there's not enough time in the day. So it's, it's RC Cars for Kids. I just pulled this up. RC yeah, Cars for Kids. On YouTube. I don't yeah, I gotta check this out. Like because, bro, you would posts. you would kill it, bro. Have you seen these huge? I don't mean to cut you off, yeah. but have you seen the RC cars nowadays? They're like, can't even see it on here. They're like huge. My my dad was gonna buy my son one for Christmas. They're like six hundred bucks, and they're like insane. And I was like, Dad, my son's turning three. Like he Z would literally, on. he would literally just go straight to the curb and wad the whole thing up. Like it's not not time yet for that that level. But bro, it's insane. You're, but this is such a, there's literally guys right now. If you go look at cars on YouTube, they're like 30 and they're sitting there playing with Hot Wheels. They build these tracks and they I race the cars. That. And my son has watched like seven hours plus of these videos where they just, they literally I mean, open all brand new cars and they race them. And it looks so fun. And they're getting like 10 million, 50 million views. Which you know, do math incredible. on that? Like that's a solid income. I'm like, bro, for your son, RC cars is 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 a niche. So hopefully he sticks with it. You know that that's a big one. Yeah. But you're like, bro, you could get RC car sponsors. You can have them donate everything. You got all the connections. What a blast it is! You slow mo those things, and you got all the small audience, the affiliates, the video views. I mean, the giveaways. It's just crazy the potential and kids are so likable. Like my first video I ever posted at Kingston, just guess how many views it got. Just just go astronomical. I would say, oh, astronomical? Oh, did you post it on YouTube or on Instagram? I posted this one on TikTok. It was my first TikTok oh, video and it was of oh, Kingston. Oh, TikTok. TikTok. I mean, what? 300,000? It's, uh, it's right here. And it is TikTok's crazy. I need to do more stuff on TikTok. I one hundred one point six million views and three hundred and fourteen thousand likes. The very first video, and I was like, and and what's crazy is I didn't even think about he was ten days old, and I I could have easily just kept that going. And again, I get the balance of not wanting to show your kids and like being yeah. safe. And so everyone has to go through all of that. I'm already public in general, so it's not very hard to like, you know, I've got cameras all in my house. I've got like all the stuff, but like, you know, I'm public enough that people could see what my son looks like through my camera and whatever. I got, I got the Navy seals on butt dial or like speed dial. I'm ready to go, you know, um, you know, keeping that out there for the show, just in case shot on site and then dragged in the house. Right. That's what they say in Texas. I can be quoted on this forever now. Um, but yeah, the, <laughs> You guys, I'm like, I like it. So I'm just poor. I'm pushing you to do it. Cause I'm like, what a cool thing. Obviously you don't want the videos to take away from everything. I get all, I have all the same feelings. Um, but man, you can get a full-time video editor overseas for a thousand bucks a month. They could do all your stuff, all help, Sarah's help stuff, all his stuff, full-time thousand, 1200 bucks a month. And you'd have the whole family, all your guys' stuff done. I have all the content because I was very good at taking all the videos and content, but the editing part, all it is is the intro and exit. It's so simple because all of our videos don't have to be perfect. So that one, I don't know if you saw the videos, the ones, because uh, I have a lot on Instagram that might've been older or pushed down or that I didn't post, but we have an area right here going down to the beach where there's kind of a walkway. And during yeah. COVID, there's no one had a job. So we're on these two, tw these lots are $10 million. So we're on on $40 million of, of dirt on the ocean. You're watching whales and dolphins jump. And yeah. he's jumping our seas on these like 25 foot hills. I mean, he had, we have the big X-Max ones. These are like 800 bucks plus batteries. Double flips, double flips, back flips. And 
everyone would stop and cheer and clap and he's bowing and he's so incredible at running. So I have all the, I have all of the, um, I have all the content, but again, it's da- it's a daunting task. I'm not good at it, but I would definitely, uh, I'm the same way, man. That. That's why I'm like, I finally, when I saw De- the Deegans, I was like, he I did pay I, for I, an editor. Well, yeah. So for them, I'm sure they started out like bare bones. They probably did it all, but you know, they had his name. He had also been a professional athlete. He had a great track record. But when I looked at my question to him and I haven't been able to get a hold of him, I don't, I just DM'd him on Instagram and was like, he hasn't seen it. I'm like, bro, when, when was that mindset shift where you, he could literally have gone over his racing career, like after it this whole time, but instead yep. he's been with his daughter, his son and propping them up. And in return, it's also created a whole family dynamic, but it's like, man, I don't know if I have, you know, I'm not there yet. Maybe I'm not called to the same thing, but I'm like, man, I very much so have been pushing forward our mission, King's Brotherhood, God's business. And I just want to, I want to hear it from him. You know, it's like this, but part of that is the, you know, the editor thing. I'm like, you know what? I'm drawing a long line in the sand and at least take some responsibility for this and do something. So like yeah. even on TikTok, bro, like they have a, uh, a thing where you can just upload a video on TikTok. Like this is Kingston's new account. I created it this weekend. Um, okay. so you, you hit the button, you hit the video, like I'm going to take him playing with the sand right here. And I know you can't okay. really like see it that well, but it uploads it. It's in slow-mo. You can see him like with his monster trucks and he hits them. Boom. Uh, and you can hit this top right button and it like adds a, a already like edit to it in music. So like that's baby shark. Oh my, that fast. And I could technically, if I was just trying to pump something out, you know, like I could just, I could just use that. So last night I did that with one of his videos and it came out to, it's just hilarious, bro. He's literally like, you probably can't see it, but it came with music. He's putting sand on there and then watch him with his drum. I feel like I'm at a hockey game. And what a ridiculous, I'm like, bro, he's either going to love me or hate me. He's got, he's got goggles on. So he has no sand in his eyes. And he's pouring sand on a bucket and just swaling it, bro. So a eight hundred dollar RC car jumping twenty five feet is definitely cooler, <laughs> but unique in, in so many collabs, so, bro. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll think, let you know. I'll you know, I'll pass you on if I find someone like an editor. Okay. I'll pass you on. It's interesting. One of my buddies that does a lot of stuff on for YouTube, these big YouTube names and everything else, he has an entire um office in ukraine of all places in poland so there's a lot of editing coming out on that side of the country incredible quality yeah i mean you think about it's not front facing right so for me like with king's brotherhood i tried as best as possible like i had a podcast studio in california and i only had american editors everything so i try my best to like i want to be able to hire here but you know i'm not going to drop right now seven to twelve thousand dollars a month on a video editor for like you know kingston playing in the sand (laughs) like you know not gonna happen but like but you know i look at people that they're it's not front face they could just they get a a course something and they're in bangladesh i think i have a guy right now in bangladesh or pakistan and he does my content videos like the podcast stuff take it do all of his thing to it and i'm like bro what a cool opportunity he's balling out you know, like just like making stupid money there, just like living a great life. And, and we have someone who has, you know, can invest the time and, and do it in an economical way that allows us to get content out. Pretty cool. Yeah. It's, it's awesome, man, but go ahead. Where did you find him? Was it on like, uh, is it Upfit or? Uh, Yeah, there's Upwork and Fiverr. And I actually recruited my, my executive assistant, Yanni worked at Fiverr corporate. So she like really knows the inner workings of how it all works and everything. So she's been a big help oh. as well. Just like figuring oh, out. I have used them people. for some other stuff. So one of the things I'm just thinking this real quick, yeah. do you have a really cool picture of Kingston? I have many. That, that you would like to see it like on a sticker. I will make you a sticker and give you your first one. So 
We have tons of different emoji stickers from actual like a digital picture of him on his dirt bike to then turning it into a cartoon. So we all have our own cartoons and stickers. I could show you a couple. I don't have my. Is this like a company that you guys made? Like a company? No, we just give them away because it when we're in all these different uh, like Mexico or trophy truck stickers, they just people love stickers. So I have one of Judah. That was a picture of him at his two-year-old birthday. He was holding like it was Baby Shark, and we turned it into a little helmet. My buddy on Fiverr, this guy I met on Fiverr, did it. Then we printed off. We have a sticker wall at our shop, so we can remember all of our cars or the trucks or these moments. He found like my other brother found this like old piece of artwork from when he was a kid. I said we're turning it into a sticker. Boom! It's like his. And my my brother's actually a graphic designer, so like just like little random things like that. But to just go back in and tie what you just shared, this is one of the greatest nuggets that will leave a legacy for your family and the generations after us if we can raise up the next generation because they matter more than anything that we're doing. Your your business, everything that God's given you in your life to do and pour in right now, the legacy is in the next generation and raising up leaders. So when we look over the last 30 years of these big movements um, from pastors to CEOs, a lot of them did not have any availability to pour in and raise up sons. We want to raise up sons that are going to go out because they had time and availability with us. So if we can use our platform for that and at least use part of our finances to keep our schedules open so that we can grow the next generation and create impact all around the world in all of these different environments. That's what it's all about. Love it, man. And let us know, how can people grab your book first off? And then second off, I would love for you to pray over us for that. The You talked a lot about the joy. And so just releasing ever, over everyone, just the ability to walk in the joy of the Lord and, and not with certain circumstances, but doesn't matter what the circumstances. Both of those things would be amazing. I've actually prayed one of the guys that came through because some guys are just wound tight. So like they might not necessarily want to be in these environments, but God is just breaking things off. Share a, th- a quick little second on me. So when me and Sarah were youth leaders, if I got invited up front to share my story or my testimony, I would always get up there and laugh. I couldn't talk. I always said, Phil doesn't pray. Something was broken off of me. So when we were at this event, it was like on a Tuesday wow. night. Someone invited us to this Bible study called Kingdom Success Church, which I don't know. That might trigger some people, but you know, God is success. So I was like, whatever, I'm going to get over it. So I'm sitting in this environment and he's teaching the word and everything else. We've been there for maybe a couple of weeks on, on these Tuesdays. And I knew that I was going to get called on and potentially go up. So what did, I wanted to run out. But I've had these different moments in my life. So what do you think happened? I was called up. Yeah. I was, Phil's going to pray for us tonight. And I walked up and said, Phil doesn't pray out loud. So I'll pray. So the pastor, Pastor Doug came up and he laid his hand on my chest. And it was probably one of the most embarrassing, but God, Holy Spirit prayers I've ever prayed in this damn like a physical dam on my heart where we say as a boxer or as an athlete, you got heart. I mean, even watching the game last night, there were some questionable calls, but man, there was some battling. There was a lot of heart that was left on the field last night. There was injuries they were playing through. God wants to unlock your heart today. So if that's you and you're on this call to be able to receive whatever it is that is maybe holding us back for, from maybe an embarrassment of entering into worship or an embarrassment of taking God into the marketplace and and holding back and saying, Holy Spirit, speak through me. I want to build rapport with someone and a commonality. If it's trucks, if it's someone saying something over my truck, okay, what is this? How are we going to roll? He wants to unlock this dam that's been on your heart that has tried to steal the potential of what God has for you in your life. And from that day forward, I've never had a problem being on a show, talking on the phone, and allowing God to flow through my heart. And then Phenomenal, I forgot man. what else I was going to share with you. Oh, finding my book. I You can find my book at, it is on Amazon. 
that's probably the easiest way. I do. I have an audio book as well, and it's actually me reading it. So it's a pretty easy. It's a very easy book to read. Um, and it's on Amazon. It's called The Secret Garage by Phil Robbins. Or you can find it also on my website at philrobbins.com in the bottom. And then all my little social links are down there as well, philrobbins.com. And uh, yeah, I could send, I'm, I'm going to send you some if you like, and then you could give them away or give them to your guys. If you like, I'll, I'll send you a whole box. Thank so, you, man. I, I think that. I think the coolest thing about my book when I was really challenged to write my book, I feel like everyone should at least write a book. The, I feel like the Lord really wrote the book through me to get out, but it is a book that 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 God really wrote to me with the chapters to keep me in the game. So on days that I go back in, I'm always when I read that book, it touches and ministers to me. Some of the chapters in the book are family, our greatest mission. Faith in finances, marketplace ministry. Uh, one of the one of my favorite chapters is one of the last chapters called "Racing to the Rescue," where God is taking you know me in this race car that I had built, which technically is not a race car, but it was a Z06 because I thought every race car had to have you know a 700 horsepower turbocharged or supercharged motor. But yet this you know so. Like whatever your desire is to have this playful, wild at heart spirit is true. God wants to unlock any area in your life where there is not this childlike faith for you to be able to enter in and to really release anything in our minds that are hindering our hearts from believing fully in God's word. Mic drop. If you could just do a short prayer for us just on that joy and that breakthrough, then we'll wrap it up. All right. All right, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, I thank you for each and every man that is on this call, man and woman, everyone that's listening to it. Holy Spirit, we just honor you. God, I just thank you that you know the plans that you have for each and every person that's on this call, plans to prosper them, plans to give them a hope and a future. For a lot of us, there was there have been things that have been stacked against us that has either wounded our minds, wounded our hearts, or even wounded our physical bodies. There are people on here that have had things stolen from them, monetarily, physically, emotionally. Father, I thank you that you that you are the great healer. And even today, that you are healing broken hearts, that you're healing bodies. Father, I thank you that you are giving each and every person a new word for this season. Even as 20, 2023 will be one of the greatest outpourings of your spirit to ever hit this planet. So for any, anyone that is listening today, God, I thank you that you are unlocking our hearts to the full potential, that the same way that we have to take an air filter off a truck that has so much silt, dust, and debris, take an air hose and blow out all of the contaminants, that you are doing that with our hearts today, Father. And I just thank you, God, that you do it with such precision, such favor, and, and it's not to harm us but it's to just clean us out so that we can be so free that we can walk out and have this joy that is unspeakable because nothing can be added or taken away from your sons and daughters. So I just thank you for just Psalm 91 protection over each and everyone's home, over their finances, over their children, and anyone that needs a miracle today that is either reaching out to Nick, everything that he's doing, God, that you are meeting us exactly where we are and that you are a miracle working God. So we just praise you and we honor you today. And we thank you that we even have time to just be here with technology today and that you would bless this. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.